What's up, guys? It's Ace Coleman here with the Champion Blueprint Podcast, and today I have Randy Groff on with Tack Veins and Schwacker Broadheads. And it looks like Randy is about to show us how to fletch Tack Veins. Um, so, Randy, why Tack Veins? Well, what we really wanted to come up with is a concept that creates more consistency. Essentially, what we found is that, you know, with with the design of our vein, the stiffness of it, the thickness, um, it's able to withstand the speed of the high, you know, the higher speeds of modern bows. And what's essentially happening is it, it kind of eliminates any lag time. So if the, the arrow wants to spin to the right and you happen to have them left helical or something like that, it's automatically going to start spinning that way immediately with our veins because the first thing they do is not fold over at all. Um, you know, it also creates a little bit of excess drag. So anybody who's judging yardage or especially if you're hunting, you know, that's a really big deal to, to be within a yard or two, if it's outside of 30 yards or whatever, you know, um, that's where it makes a really big difference. And so we have a little flatter trajectory than most other veins in the market. Um, one of the biggest things that we what we noticed in our design is because of that consistency of spin that it actually creates um, less wind drift as well. So like side by side with any other vein that's comparable in size, you can test it for yourself. It will it will have considerably less wind drift. And obviously in a in a competition, that's a that's a big deal. For sure. And I apologize for anyone listening to this video. We're going to have a lot of visual stuff going on. So if you haven't already, go to Ace Coleman Archery on YouTube to watch the actual podcast. But anyway, for the people that have never heard of tack veins or have never tried tack veins and they don't really know what the hype is about, I guarantee that like, if you just pick up a vein, you'll see what's different. So... If someone was to grab a tack vein, Randy, and they were to to compare it to other veins that they've shot in the past, what's the difference? Like with the weight, with the stiffness, what what is really the package they're getting? So when you first open them up, I mean, to be honest, they're relatively flexible, you know, right out of the package. They don't feel like super stiff because what we're using, we're using the tensile strength of the arrow to actually stiffen it up you know the because our base is really thin you know the amount of material that would technically go between the clamp and the arrow is so thin and so low profile that it's not adding to the stiffness to it as soon as you stick it to the arrow and it's stuck fast you'll feel this it almost feels like a guitar pick um, is one of the best ways that i can kind of describe it so you're going to get a lot more stiffness out of them right out of the right as soon as you get them on the arrow wow I definitely see that. So, and what's also really cool about this vein is the weight. I kind of alluded to that. It's like you, you're able to make it stiff because it has the backbone of the arrow shaft. So it's like flexible out of the package. You put it on the arrow shaft and then it stiffens it up, so to speak. But it's not like a super heavy vein. It's relatively light compared to the stiffness. If there was like a stiffness to weight ratio, I think you guys would have it for sure. Like the best in class. Yeah, no comparison really. And I mean, just straight side by side, like any other like two and three quarter inch vein on the market, there's none that aren't like at least that ours aren't at least 20% lighter. Some of them were probably like 30, 35% lighter, you know, size, size to size. Wow. Awesome. So there a lot of guys that want to get like the, the most front of center as possible and things like that. And so there's a lot of our guys that really like it, especially guys that are really loading up the front end on, on uh, hunting arrows and things. I mean, there's all different opinions on that. There's science that says yes or no on that, but there are people that want to do it. There are people that are seeing the benefits. It's one of the things that's just kind of inherit with our brand, just being lighter right off the bat. So it's ne it's never going to hurt. For sure. So, um, as far as vein selection, um, for like a fixed blade or like an expandable, just a normal size shaft or like a micro diameter, what are your recommendations for hunting arrows and vein size and like vein configuration, three fletch, four fletch? 
So our three most popular models for hunting, and I should have them here, but I don't, um, all three of them, but the 275 driver is this one. That is definitely our most popular hunting vein as of right now. Um, like if you were to, let's just stick to like, if we're talking about a mechanical broadhead, 90% of the mechanical broadheads, if you three fletch this right here, it is going to have more than enough stability to support it. You know, there's absolutely no problem. Um, with uh, the 275, if you were to four fletch it, you could shoot any fixed head on the market. There are a lot of fixed heads that have like, it's more of the traditional style, like the triangle shape points that are like, that maybe don't have vents in them and things. So what we remember is that's almost like putting veins on the front. So you've got to have enough vein and enough steering to steer from the back. And that keeps your center of pressure back, which essentially is your lever arm, you know, like the farther back your veins are like, and that's another point that I'll just throw in there is sidebar is essentially if you put your veins as far back as possible, you're increasing the amount of influence your um, veins will give to the arrow because it increases the lever arm. Um, so it's like putting a pipe on a wrench, you know, the farther out you are, the more torque you're able to put on it. Same with an arrow. And so when you have that big traditional style broadhead, you want to make sure you have enough vein back there. And so for like a 275 vein in particular, I always recommend putting four on because one awesome thing that we found is because of that consistency of spin that we make, you're little, you could literally shoot at this in a three fletch versus this in a four fletch. With a field point at a hundred yards, it's pretty much going to hit the same spot, even though it's like six grains heavier with the four fletch, it essentially equals out. Um, and so if we go down to like the next most popular size would be the two, two, five driver, obviously it looks exactly the same as this, just a half inch shorter. And what I recommend for those now, those are also a little bit lower profile than this vein and it's only like 10,000. So it's small. Um, but if you talk about the whole radius of it, you're talking about 20 thousands. Um, so it's definitely going to have a little less surface area. And what I tell folks is that there's a chance that you could three fletch a two, two, five driver and shoot most mechanicals. You're probably going to be fine. To shoot a fixed head with three two two fives, it wouldn't be my top recommendation because there's not any measurable benefit to go away from a two seven five to go to a two two five when you only save one grain in in weight on the vein, three grains on a set or four grains if you four fletch. There's just not a measurable benefit um, because you want to make sure you have enough carrying power in the back to support your broadhead. And that is the ultimate goal, accuracy over anything when it comes to hunting, target, any of that. Um, so that would be our next most popular. But what I generally tell folks, and same thing, you know, if you three fletch or four fletch, I mean, shoot them at 100 yards, they're pretty much going to hit about the same spot. Very, very similar. And so I tell most people that no matter what broadhead you shoot, if you're going to shoot the two, two fives, I'd four fletch them. If you can, that's going to just okay. ensure the carrying power. Um, and, uh, what we found also, and a fun fact about our veins is that we have like the matrix style, which is this one, you know, it has like kind of the bat wing design and essentially what this is, this is is I have this is a 175 matrix on my 3D arrows. And we also have a 175 driver, which is super low profile. They are definitely not equal just because they're the same length. The higher profile is automatically going to give you more carrying power. So what you'll find in, in any of our vein selection is that if you, for instance, have like this 175 matrix has the almost exact same carrying power as a two inch driver and the only difference is the length to height ratio the matrix are our high profile series where the driver is our lower profile series just longer and lower and so what i find is that <clears throat> when you go to the, our third most popular was what i was kind of getting at with that is the 225 matrix the 225 matrix is a half inch high so it's it's a uh, twenty five thousandths higher than this model right here. So you're going to get considerably more carrying power. And then the other interesting thing is that this being a half inch longer and twenty thousandths lower will have almost identical carrying power to a two two five matrix. 
But what the 225 matrix will do, that one, it, it does not matter what broadhead you shoot. You could three fletch it and it's going to fly like a dart. You know, it yeah. does not matter what broadhead, whether it's a big traditional or not. Mechanical, especially, is super easy. That's sim- more similar to a field point. Um, and so what I find is you can definitely shoot those with anything. But in order, those are our most three most popular hunting arrows or hunting vein models. Right. Very nice. Um, I wanted to add something to allude to that um, with the carrying power of the vein. So for my outdoor arrows, um, like 50 meter style stuff, I have ran the one, I think it's the 1.75, the bat wing, the matrix vein. And I shot those really, really well. And I have also shot the 1.75 driver vein. And for me, I, I kind of like the bigger the bigger profile for those arrows, the really small ones. I'm running like 120 or 140 grain point, and it's like it has has that little extra bit of leverage while the arrow is flying. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would agree 100%. So essentially what that's doing is that's going to continue to bring your center of pressure back on the arrow, increasing your lever arm to do it because – you know, there's there's a lot of factors involved, and I'm not going to lie. I don't know how to measure it, but I will say that, like, depending on your arrow length, depending on the shape of your point, you're essentially making an airfoil that comes up around that arrow, and you have turbulence going all around your arrow the whole length of it. And so when it comes up here, if you got a vein that's not up in clean air, you're not getting as much performance as you would if you have one up in that clean air to really grab and start spinning. Um, wow. So that, like my probably my number one answer to that is uh, side by side. You're going to find that now, if you were to shoot the two inch driver in comparison to a one seven five that Ace was talking about, you know, I think you're going to find that there are going to be a little more similar. Um, they're still a good bit lower profile, like a two inch driver is a uh, 400 thousands high. And this one seven five matrix is a uh, 440 thousands high. So it's 40 thousands higher, you know, which is, which is pretty substantial when it comes to, you know, the overall diameter, because you got to realize that it doesn't just go up on one side, it goes up on all sides. So you're adding 40 thousands of carrying power from wow. this side, to, you know, so it'll make a pretty big difference. Absolutely. So like I was going to flush some arrows for uh, the shoot off at indoor nationals, um, some outdoor arrows before I actually shoot them outside. Um, We also have the Dakota Classic coming up, which is going to be in April this year instead of in August. And um, I am definitely going to try the Matrix 1.75s out on those, probably in a three fletch. Would you be opposed to trying that in a four fletch on like a like a revelation from Black Eagle? I think it would be a little bit much. I mean, the other thing to consider, the the one thing to consider for sure, in my opinion, is definitely going to be wind drift. And this comes from several other pros too, that they've compared sizes and things. And they're like, the accuracy of that one is there, but if it's real windy that day, I'm going to this one, you know, and it's all based on, you know, the environment that you're going to be in and you do your best to try to stay out of the wind. Like I said earlier, I mean, I do strongly believe, and I've heard it, you know, from quite a few people, I've tested it with other veins that on the same day, it's definitely not or on, you know, if, if you get the exact same wind, we've got considerably less wind drift, but ultimately the less surface area you've got back there in veins is going to keep you out of the wind even more. So that's such a small diameter arrow. Um, most of the time what I found, and and it, as a matter of fact, this actually came from Dan McCarthy, and he, he really helped me to choose um, sizing based on the OD of the arrow. You know, he said, look, when, when he tested, he said a revelation. He liked the 175 driver on them because it was it was low profile it's small enough and because the arrow is so small it didn't need a ton of aim sticking up off of it the points are low profile so it's not creating a you know the big airfoil that i was talking about or that turbulence um but he said that you know when he put them on an x impact that he felt like he didn't have as much control or as much steering so he said wow. look he said, i think you can safely recommend to people to shoot the two inch driver 
when you go to a one six six arrow. So, yep. excuse me, that's what I've been recommending. That's what I've kind of tested against. And I mean, what I'm seeing is, a, is, is exactly that. Um, but again, you kind of have um, that flexibility and going to shorter and higher profile on a matrix or longer and lower profile in a driver. Um, so if I was to try one on a revelation, it would not hurt to try a 175 matrix at all. Um, but based on that, I mean, I think you could probably be, so you'd be out of the wind a little more with the 175 driver. If it happens to be like, if you're going to Arizona cup or something like that, guess what? Yeah. It's very likely to be windy and, yeah. you know, so you're, you're going to want to aim as close as you can to it. You know, I, I mean, I've definitely heard reports um, from the last few years, at, you know, specifically at Arizona Cup um, that, you know, literally guys like I've never been able to aim inside the nine, you know what I mean, on on most of the time. And I'm aiming right. That's at the edge nuts. Of it. You know, and and that to me made a pretty big difference and you know, really made me understand and, and prove that, you know, the wind drift is a real thing or the lack thereof. OK, so you heard it from Randy himself. It sounds like the best vein combo for outdoor target arrows is a 1.75 driver on like a revelation from Black Eagle. Um, that's like a what? 3.2 millimeter. Yeah. And then a 166 arrow where, you know, the knock is like a 166. Um, a matrix is a good option or a two inch. The 1.75 matrix or a two inch driver will be good. So, awesome. Exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly the configuration I've had. I have had a three fletch 1.75 matrix on an X impact. And I have a set of revelations with the 1.75 um drivers so and no complaints at all so but anyway so i get this a lot and really this podcast is really going to dispel a lot of limiting beliefs around the product um they are extremely good if you know how to flush them properly but a lot of people have issues as you well know with Getting them to stick. I want to. I want to use quotations. Getting them to stick. I don't think it's a problem with the vein guys. I think it's really a problem with understanding your jig setup and the process of <coughs> applying the vein, the glue, the primer, the entire process. If it's really an issue with that, uh, 90, 99 percent of the time. But anyway, uh, Randy, go go right ahead and show us what you got. Okay, cool. Well, um, a couple of the main points that I've kind of come to realize is like the number one thing is that I've been in this industry now 19 years, and I'm not the most knowledgeable, but I'm not going to claim that by any means. But I've learned something about these, especially as I made them, is um, the couple things. Number one, well, first off, I'll start by saying, in those 19 years, I can't remember the last time I bought something or got something and was like, how's this work? Let me read the instructions. Yeah, we don't do that. I get it. Right. And, but right. this is a little bit different. If you use the same old way that you've always used, you know, like it might work. It's probably a better chance that if you totally follow the directions, that it has a better chance of working. So the number one thing is every package, all of our glue, all of our veins, every package has this QR code on the back. And I'm calling that out because I strongly recommend it's about a three minute video and there's about a two minute read. It's worth your time. You know, it really is. Look at it, get an idea, like some of the things that I highly recommend that you do that will make a really big difference. And I also hear the number one thing I hear is I'm using your prime. Well, I'm sorry, back up. Um, the reason that we, we, that we did this was because we created an adhesion guarantee. If you're using our primer pen, and you're using our glue, then we guarantee the adhesion. You know, ideally, very ideally, that you're using a clamp style jig is what we recommend the most. Um, there are plenty of other jigs out there that work really well. Um, depending on the jig, there's like one or two little things you may have to do in addition. But I can kind of sum them all up based on even using this one and talking through some of the points. So 
what you're going to find is this, this is a siren acro like glue, super glue, same thing. This only cures on the absence of air. If you have a gap in your vein anywhere, it is not going to cure completely. It's not going to cure properly and everything. So the, here's my short, my very short sentence is that if you're priming the, the vein, you glue it immediately after and you stick it on there. And, and after five seconds, if you pull that clamp off, if the vein's not stuck, don't fletch another vein. Move the jig. Move the jig. I know a lot of guys that are super hesitant to move their jig. Oh, I've had it set here for these arrows. For so <laughs> I, can fletch, I can fletch this vein, this vein, this vein on it, and then yours doesn't stick. And here's the difference. You could literally move one of your adjustments 15 or 20 thousandths. And ours will stick exactly the same also if you follow our process. So oftentimes I have a lot of people that, and what I found that works best is that I'm like, if you have any problems and if you're going to see me at an event, please bring me your jig, bring me your arrow and your veins, and I will help you set the jig. So with this style jig, that is, that is the secret. That is the missing link for, I mean, I want to be conservative. 95% of people that have a problem fletching our veins. Um, I understand that it's frustrating. There's nothing worse than like having a vein. Like, like it looks good, but it's just not sticking. You know, trust me. Right. I've heard it all. I'm not offended. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm pretty tough. I can, I can handle it, but I want people to, I want to help people to understand what the difference is. So in short, if you prime it, glue it, stick it, and it doesn't stick in five seconds, you've got to move the jig. Um, because what I find is that people say, hey, look, I don't have any problems keeping them on, but I hold them on for like 30 seconds at a time. I'm like, hey, if that works for you and you've got the time, that's great. If you have an archery shop or something like that and you want to be banging them out, you know what I mean? Like then just make some more adjustments wow. to your jig and you're going to find that it's going to be five seconds, you know, at most. And when you have them set perfect, I mean, I'll hold it for like three seconds and I'm going to show you, I'm going to demo it. I'm going to do it right on film, you know, and you're going to see because literally when, well, what I find too, back to the point about some of the folks that hold them for 30 seconds or a minute or whatever, there's two problems with that. In my opinion, the number one is if you have to hold it longer to acquire a, a, a good bond, it's masking a problem in my opinion. And if wow. you get them to get them to stick within 30 seconds, then you're probably like insanely close to the perfect spot. Yeah. So the opera is small. I will admit that with our veins, but roughly uh, it's going to be about a two and a half degree helical. If you use a bits of murder with a helical clamp, another big, big thing. I don't recommend straight clamps. You know, the, so the reason why is I don't know that you're going to be able to see real well, but like the height or the amount of material in our base that will essentially go between the clamp and the arrow is next to nothing. When I first made the veins, I had them thicker, but the material is so dense that it didn't squish anyway. That's essentially what you're getting with most other veins that are squishier or softer is they have enough base that it can squish at one spot to allow contact somewhere else to, to acquire that seal. That's why wow. I straight as well. My primer pen straight. If I try to sit this on this arrow at one or two degrees, how much contact do you think I can make? Not very much, you know, so that's what is missing. And that is why the operating window is smaller, um, but it's not totally necessary because when you get that two and a half degree helical, you can fletch and sh or you can shoot any broadhead. You can shoot any field point, of course. Um, and it's rare that there's, there's, there's very few cases of people that are like, no, I put less helical on and they shot better. And that, that was a, really unusual circumstance um, of one really great shooter that I know has done that. And he was shooting triple X's uh, indoors. It's uh, like a 100 or 150 spine, super stiff and like a hundred or 120 grains. So real light screaming fast and the veins were slightly oversteering and it would kind of make the point hit just a little off. And this is a guy that's shooting 60 X's pretty often. And yeah. so he was basically, and he was just missing some by hair. He took a little helical out and he started pounding them. 
You know, so like that was like the only case I've ever seen that. So if you got a super stiff arrow with a fairly light point, you may not want as much helical, but you can probably still do it with a helical clamp and maybe take a little more out. Um, But so back to kind of setup of the jig again, this is like 95% of the problems come right here. So I'm going to totally walk through it, talk about a couple of things that I've learned. I mean, I used a Bits and Burger a long time before I before I came down here to make these veins and everything. And I've learned a lot just as I'm playing with ours and playing with different veins and working with it. And the number one thing that I've learned that was really cool is most times I find with our veins and look, these marks they're not pr- crazy precise or anything. These magnets could vary. Your clamp could vary. There's a lot right. of things. I can't just take a picture of this and say, set your jig here and you're going to be golden. <laughs> but I can say that in most cases, I, I use a left helical clamp for almost everything. But what I find is if you put the knock end adjustment real close to center, put it right on center to start and, and start there. And I have an Allen wrench on me. But if you leave your front adjustment loose, this is what will really help you to find the perfect spot right off the bat is so in your clamp, when you fletch our veins, we highly recommend you leave about an eighth inch gap, you know, between the the edge of the base and the edge of the clamp that helps to like contour the vein a little bit to the, the radius of the arrow. And it'll help to squeeze some of that glue out, disperse the glue. And then when you press, which I'll show you, it will go up in. But for this setup period, you want to smash it the whole way in. Okay. Make sure you're on the mark that you're going to use. You know, I'm, I'm on the one that I'm, I'm going to use for this. And so start there with this front adjustment loose, the back one snug, stick it on there. Okay. And with your one hand, move your, you can see, move your adjustment back and forth. And at the same time, use your other hand. And you, what you want to do is you want to rock the clamp this way. Okay. You can see that hopefully, um, yes. but rock the clamp stuck to the magnet this way. And what you're going to find is you're going to adjust, you're going to push that offset back and forth. And there's going to be a spot where that rock all comes out. And there's a spot that you can actually let go of this adjustment. And even though it's loose, you, you'll, you'll push that on and this will not move. Start right there. Snug that down. Check it one more time. I can feel that I already have this one set. So I know that it's rock solid. And so that is always your starting point. If your vein doesn't stick there, I can almost guarantee you that it's going to be a tiny adjustment maybe to the front, maybe to the back, most likely to the front. But the other thing you can do is after you set that, you can get come over here to the side and you if you pick the, I don't know how good to be able to illustrate here, but if you pick the lamp up and you slowly slide it back down while you're looking really closely at it, if you look and you see, all right, the front two corners of the vein base is hitting at the same time. That's a really good indicator that you're probably right there. You're probably real close. If you see that one side is very clearly hitting more than the other, you might as well move it to where you can get both hitting about the same time. Check exactly. the front and check the front and back and see what you get. Um, I have heard more than a handful of times. No, I can see that it's like perfect. I can see that it's really sealed. I can see it's golden. You know, and I'm like, well. If it isn't sticking in five seconds, move the jig. It doesn't matter. It like it's it's not sealing because that's what it's totally identifying for you right there. So um, when you get it set, that's where you start. That's your spot. Um, I'll come back can, to clean. Can I make um, can I make a few comments? Yeah, please. Cool. So in my experience, what you're saying is absolutely spot on. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So a lot of guys, especially, you know, people that have shops with those round tables of bits and burgers, right? They'll they'll take the take the vein, they'll put glue on it, and they'll put it on the clamp and then they'll leave it alone. 
and then they'll come back. What are your thoughts on that? Yep. That's not my recommendation. Um, okay. Because that operating window is small. I personally, now, I've kind of been challenged one time. You know, a, a guy with a shop who fletches a lot of arrows, he said, there's no way you can fletch faster than I can on a wheel, you know, like a, a wheel of bits of murders, you know. And I'm like, I don't know for sure, but I would be willing to bet that it it might be comparable, but I can tell you 100% that mine will be cleaner, you know, because when you leave, when you leave the clamp on there, there's two things to that, in my opinion. The first three second, two to three seconds of good pressure makes a big difference with our vein. Yes. You know, if you just, if you just stick it on, guess what? That magnet's not pushing. It's, it's, it's holding it that way. You need pressure right. that way. And so like, the this first is interesting. Three, okay. Yeah. The first three seconds makes a really big difference. So if you have the jig set perfectly, you know, and you squeeze that on there real good for even for two seconds, it's going to be fine. But if you don't put much pressure on that and you go to the next jig, which how do you know it's set exactly the same? You don't. Yeah. Period. You do, you, you don't know that, you know, you can like, you couldn't even hardly use a micrometer to establish whether or not it's exactly the same. It just, it just isn't really that possible. Right. And so what I find is one jig can work every bit as good as anything else. It's just going to be a matter of figuring out your process and you have to get used to the process as well. Um, yep. Want to kind of grab a, can we pause and then you, can we pause? Yeah. Will that work? Um, yeah, just do whatever you need to do. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay, guys, Randy is going to get something. Um, so, We'll probably leave this in, but absolutely what he's saying is is spot on. It's very important with tack veins to push the vein base onto the shaft, make sure it's the corners on the front and the back are flat, and you are pushing the glue out of the ends, holding it in place for like five seconds, 10 seconds. You shouldn't have to go longer than 10 seconds. And then opening the clamp, cleaning it, rotating to the next one. You don't want to just touch it and let it go. You want to press the vein, press the vein base, hold it, and then immediately take the clamp off. You see, um, I'll, I'll talk to him about this later, but what we'll find is, there, there's Randy, okay. So I was, I was talking to the guys while you were gone about the importance of Pressing, pushing the glue out of the ends, making sure you have a tight fit, right? Making sure the corners are down straight. And, you know, five, 10 seconds, you should be able to take that clamp off and rotate to the next one. You don't need to, like, just, like, let go of the clamp. I, I don't like that because what I've found with the Bits and Burger jig is, especially with a lot of shops, they... They don't take care of the magnets and the magnets get weak over time and and the clamp is going to move up and want to pull that vein off if you let go depending on your jig what are your thoughts on that yeah that's absolutely right and that's where I, that's what i'll be able to demonstrate is just to show that it doesn't take long it doesn't take 10 15 20 30 seconds uh per vein um it will literally stick in five seconds when you have a perfect seal. Now, um, we have like pretty extensive quality control um, processes in place for our veins. Um, there are a handful of things that, you know, like I'm going to admit, you know, like, well, first off, there's not a single vein company on the market that has not had at some point where people had problems getting them to stick. Could be one reason or another, but I'm telling you every single one, you can name any one of them. I promise you they've had some sort of an issue at some point where people have had a problem getting them. Um, and all it is most of the time is a learning curve. Um, but what I will say about our veins is when, when we make them the way we make them and the QC uh, things that we have in place, like if you have, let's just say I have one pack of green ones and I have like a, a pack of pink ones, right? and they were made, they could be made one day after the next day. 
but there could be a very slight change in the base. You know, it's not going to be substantial. It's not going to make them not stick, but what it may require, and here's where I learned it. I was fletching some arrows for a guy one time and he wanted two turquoise and one black. So I stuck a turquoise on, perfect. Stuck the second turquoise on, perfect. Turned it, went, did the black one and it came off. I'm like, who's doing these arrows, you know? So (laughs) off, and I clean the arrow real good. I stick it back on there, try another black one, didn't stick again. I'm like, all right. So then I thought, all right, I'm going to start over. So I grab a new arrow. I stuck it in there. I made a slight adjustment to it, fletched a black one. It stuck. Then I did a turquoise. It stuck. Turquoise, it stuck. I'm like, oh, so all it's going to ever take, if you're mixing two colors and one of the color isn't sticking, it's not a release agent. It's not any of these crazy things. It's not because the base looks a little different. You know, it's just a slight adjustment to the jig. Again, that's where it's going to fall into that 95 percentile. Move the jig. Yep. Move you know the I mean, jig. that's what I think. You know, worst case, you move the jig, and I can guarantee you beyond the shadow of a doubt that any one of our veins, especially if you're using this style of a jig, it applies pressure to the very to the very center of the base. That's what you need is pressure right there. If you're putting pressure only in the outside edges of it, well, guess what? You're not going to actually get the middle to seat. I had to create some radius to the, I don't know if you can see with a black background, but I had yes. to create some perfect radius to the base. And so what you got to do is it, is it has to press it down in the middle to allow those flanges to flatten out. And so if you've got a jig that's only putting pressure on the outside edges, or if it's a jig that has just a slot, and you stick the vein in it and then you stick it down like the slot is probably going to be considerably wider than our vein, especially the body of our, of our vein, because that's why we're 25 to 35% lighter is because I've got a lot less material and thickness. And so if that slotted type jig, you know, isn't putting pressure in the middle, it's not going to get a great seal, you know? So that's a couple of the things that I found that that definitely make a big difference. But because you're because this style jig grabs the body of the vein up here, and when you press it down, it's going to stick the middle of the vein base, the whole length of it, down flat. When you have that perfect spot. Very nice. Okay, so pressure. Would you say pressure and alignment is key to getting these veins to apply properly? Yep. Yep. Uh, I would say in reverse order, alignment is number one pressure. You don't have to go crazy. It's not going to like, you're not going to be like shaking to hold it, hold it together. Yeah, yeah. I had to guess I'm probably going to put three pounds of pressure squeezing the arrow and the clamp together. And I, and I, and I think we've all done it. If we fleshed enough, you'd rolled the clamp off the side and stuck glue down, down your hand and everything else. I get that that happens. Once you get to a spot, you know, like I just found like spots that I like put each of my fingers and my thumb and everything else, like a certain spot that I just know that I can, I can apply good pressure and it's not going to slip off. Um, Especially when you have this set just right where that clamp doesn't rock. If it rocks, that's probably why that happens most likely. Or if it's a squishy base vein, you know what I mean? That can happen as well. That's not the case with ours. It's definitely our materials stiff the whole way through. So. Cool. Well, um, if anyone has any questions about adhesion or jig setup, just comment below on this video and we should be able to get you straightened out. But I believe, I believe we've talked about everything they need to know. Anyone in the audience should know concerning getting these to stick and they're, they're excellent veins. I, I think it's, it's definitely worth learning how to fletch a different vein. You know what I mean? So like if you're used to fletching something that's a little squishier, maybe you were able to have a different process with getting them to stick. Maybe it was just something you're used to, but I would highly recommend to adopt this new process for these veins. So, but yeah, um, it looks like you have a arrow and you're going to show us how it's done. So if you're listening, watch the video and you'll get the full experience. So yeah, let's, let's see how this is done.
All right. So a couple more small points. Um, like one thing that gets missed a lot is with the primer pen. So once again, we don't okay. read instructions. I get that. I don't read instructions, but I'm encouraging you just to take it might take some people two minutes. It might take others 30 seconds, but read the instructions real quick. One of them, probably the most important one on here is more is not better. And more so better. like more is not better. And that's in all caps. So what you do, the number one thing with the primer pen is essentially this is, has a long spring in it. It has a trap door that holds the, holds the liquid in. So when you first open it, you have no idea how much pressure might possibly have been built up in there. So when you first get it, I always tell people, put the tip side up so the liquid's down here and less and just detonate it, you know, just let the air out. And oftentimes you'll find, even if it sits here for 10, 15, 20 minutes, you'll come back, you might go, and you'll hear just a tiny little bit of air that was in there. Well, guess what? If you do it with the tip side down and you open the door, it pukes out everywhere. So to eliminate that, just detonate it one time, and that'll be enough. Then flip it over, and personally, I generally will hit that about one time. You know, when it's brand new, it might take a little more than that. But what I had to run for is a piece of paper. So okay. use the paper specifically. If you use a paper towel, it's not the same. What I do is I generally have a paper towel handy, and I have that to the side here. I use I use a Post-it note typically, and what you do is. Uh, try to stay where you can see it. Just yes. touch this. Your dot should be about a quarter inch in diameter. If you've got a way bigger dot, which I'm just going to make one, that's too much. <laughs> so if you get that, take this and just roll it off on the paper towel a little bit just okay. to dry it a bit, and then come back, touch your paper again, and just a touch, and you get a quarter inch dot, that's golden. That will make a big difference. And so what I've adopted into my process is I always have this thing sitting right here. And because this is clear, it's invisible. When you prime the vein, you can look at it and be like, did I do it? <laughs> you know, well, yeah. there's no way, there's no unit of measure. So this is my unit of measure for you to know how much moisture is on the end of your tip is that you, you try to make a quarter inch dot and no bigger than that. And that will definitely help. Um, so again, if you get too much, roll a little bit off. I get it to a quarter inch dot. All right. And now I'm ready to roll. So as we do with any other vein, you put your knock end, you know, in, in your, in your spot, leave a little bit of a gap like that. Okay. Now this is very simple. And what you'll find is you do not scrub the primer pen. You literally start on one end and go to the other. Even if you have to go slow to get good coverage, that's it. One swipe. Within 10 seconds, my tip's a little bit clogged up. Within 10 seconds, follow that with a bead of glue. I don't personally recommend um, dots and smearing it. I recommend one straight bead of glue. All right. right here, you can count them, whatever, whatever's easiest. I squeeze that together for about three to five seconds. I let it go because then you're not moving the jig. You're not wiggling or anything like that. Pull the clamp off. Wipe one side with a Q-tip. Turn your knock receiver. Wipe the other side. And I'm going to fletch all three so I don't have to pull it off the, off the knock receiver. And I'll show you how fast that it's going to be stuck permanently. Wow. But so you can, what did you do to clean the arrow shaft before you started doing that? Good question. That is actually not nearly as critical with our veins as I've heard. I've heard of people that do a lot of different crazy things. They're like, I did acetone, and then I did alcohol and then water and I did a headstand and and they still <laughs> didn't. And I'm like, man, well, I'll tell you what I do. You know, it's like, and I got another one here I could demo too. I've literally been in the heat of the moment, strip some veins. I'll wipe it off with my hand. It's not really my recommendation. He's got oil in your fingers, but it doesn't really matter. It's not that critical. What I've, what I've found is that if you've got a brand new arrow, it's never been fletched straight from the factory. More often than not, what I find is if you take just a little bit of sandpaper, 
you do not don't go over the ed, the back edge but like stop about an you know a half inch from the edge and if you just scuff them just a real little bit you know just where you're gonna fletch just uh, just add a little texture to it and then just clean with water just regular tap water on a clean paper towel wipe them off that's generally enough um the other option is obviously acetone does not hurt your arrows. Um, like it does not hurt or break down the arrow or epoxy or any of that stuff. Like you can use acetone, but I still would follow with water because even though it's residue free, it's technically not, you know, in, in our company, one of our other companies, we have a lab that that was one of the first things he told me when I was telling him about our primer pen and telling him about acetone and stuff. He's like, well, acetone still leaves residue behind. And so that's where I, and, and talking to some other folks, uh, Dan McCarthy in, in particular, he said, he said, if you use acetone, it's fine. It doesn't hurt anything, but always follow it with water, just regular tap water on a clean paper towel. And it'll make sure any bit of residue is gone. You know, so nice. I, I think that that can make a little difference, but I still, it's not nearly as critical, you know, the prep of the arrow, how you do that stuff is just not nearly as critical as I think a lot of people give it weight. Um, you know, so I, I literally I've, I've had more than a few that I strip off, wipe them off from the hands, stand there and fletch them and they're not going to come off, you know, because of anything like that. So, um, like I said, I'm going to finish this arrow real quick and I don't want to drag it out for everybody, but I check it real quick. I got a quarter inch dot still just make one swipe, one bead of glue. And another uh, another tip. So whenever you're fletching, if you're a nice, neat fletcher and you do a real good job, which is really rare, but there are some of you. If you do a really nice, neat job and you've got really good glue control and you don't have any issues with anything like that, then what I recommend is if you start your bead about a quarter inch down from the end and you end your bead a quarter inch down from the other end, what it does is it uses that little bit of glue that comes out rather than all of it coming from the end, just going all over your clamp. So the cleaner you can keep your clamp, that's going to help as well. Um, again, because of the height of our bases, you know, so if you've got a big glob of glue stuck to your clamp, it may not be allowing an adequate pressure to the base of our vein. And so you've got to make sure that that stays good and clean. And that definitely helps because it, it uses up some for that last quarter inch because it always comes out the end of the trough. And so when you use that little bit, it makes a big difference. And uh, another another big point is when you when you um, are using your primer, like you make sure that you only use one. Sorry. I got glue on my clamp. <laughs> <laughs> But that's okay. Um, and so you only use one swipe, and you and the reason I don't recommend smearing the glue is is essentially the primer pen is is opening up the pores of the plastic, which allows the glue to penetrate. And so when you have that, you are and when you smear your plastic glue tip in that acetone, it is actually going to eat parts of your glue tip off and it gets mixed in with your glue. So it's contaminating your bond right off the bat if you're if you're smearing it that way. Wow. And so find is that it's definitely a whole lot better to um, just make sure that you you prime it, you glue it, and you stick it. And that is definitely the process. The um, and and so that like I said, that'll make a big difference. But they're all it's fletched, it's on there, it is not going to come off, and it just came out of the jig. You know, like it is on just there. Just came out. There you have it, guys. Point: You can shoot that thing through plywood, and it pretty much won't come off. You know, and so that is the critical parts of fletching our veins. Is mostly set up with a jig. You know, prime it, glue it, stick it. Five seconds, pull the clamp. If you want to hold it for ten seconds, and you got time, it doesn't matter. But if it doesn't stick within five it probably is going to tell you, Hey, I might need to move this jig just slightly to acquire a better seal. And the exactly. reason why the clamp is allowing that to happen is because when you find the perfect spot, the, the vein is always pointed towards center. Okay. 
as the helical comes around, it continues to point the vein towards center. With a straight clamp, it's trying to go across the radius, like I was saying earlier, and it's just not able to do that and acquire a seal. You know, so I have a lot of guys say that I do a I do your veins with a two degree left offset with a straight clamp. And I I'm not gonna lie, I don't know how to measure that. I don't I, I'm sure I know somebody that knows how to measure how many degrees it is from the front to the back. I don't care, you know, personally. Right. Um, but what I have found is that, that when I've had them measured, it's about two and a half degrees is where a helical clamp on a bits of burger jig is going to put it on most arrow diameters, you know, wherever you have it set, it's pretty much where it's going to end up. So, uh, the other thing I was going to mention about the primer pen is when you prime the vein, the reason I'm saying to glue right after is because that those pores will be open for I'm told no more than 25 to 30 seconds and the vein reheals itself. And it's like, you didn't prime it. And so I've had people that go through and they're like, I'm going to prime my whole pack. So yeah. they go through and they pull all the veins and they stack them all there and they come back. And the first, first arrow is good. Second arrow, they start coming off. It's because the vein wow. already rehealed re itself. So that's another critical step. So you check to make sure you don't have, you're not going to soak the, the vein in this because when you if you have a lot of this this is this is mostly acetone um not gonna lie but then the other ingredient is the t word it's about that long and uh so <laughs> when that will make sure that any bit of residue that the acetone will leave behind is going to be gone and so when you prime it you gotta you gotta apply your glue right after and if you've got a bunch of like beads of the of this primer still on there and you mix it with the glue it's not as strong of a bond you know so that's another good reason to regulate how much moisture you actually have on it with your piece of paper so another critical part of why you why i recommend to do that all in the instructions so very awesome yeah the all of those things um before i started using tack veins i was using a different vein and i found that I I would do the dots. I would smear a ton of primer on the vein. I would clean the shaft with acetone. I wouldn't wipe it with water or anything and would have that residue left behind. And a lot of times I would just put it on there and just let it sit and then take it off. You know what I mean? And, and with some veins that does work, with tack veins, it, it has that small window, like you said. So... But yeah, I think you did an extremely good job of explaining how how to fletch tack veins. So, thank you. I've learned learned over the years, and like I said, I've learned more and more things to say that you know are simplified ways of looking at it a little bit differently than we used to, and things like that. But most of it is that first three seconds of pressure is critical. If you pull the clamp off after five and it's not stuck, move the jig. You know, so that's. That's my short version that I tell everybody. And uh, I've had more than a few people that are like, I can see my jig set perfect. And then when I go and I look at it, like the veins like sticking off like that far. I'm like, <laughs> all right. it's all right. I'll just make a little adjustment to it. We can get that right. You know, so that's most of the time what it is, is moving the jig. So. Absolutely. So one last thing um, that you told me this weekend in Foley, um, I had some arrows that I hadn't shot for like a year and they were thrown in an arrow box that I had at Lancaster uh, that I got from Lancaster. I just threw them in the box and some of the veins were kind of folded over and it's like they kept their shape. So how would you advise people to fix that problem without having to completely refletch their arrows? Yeah, I definitely have. Uh, I, admittedly, um, I'm, I'm brutally honest and it's OK, you know, but like admittedly, I've had total mixed reviews on this. I've had a lot more people say, man, I shot one of these through a bag target. It was wrinkled up. It was terrible. I thought, man, I'm definitely going to reflex that when they stick it in the back of their quiver. They keep shooting. And all of a sudden they're like, they look and they're like, where's that arrow at? And they can't tell because it comes back. So when I was first making the different mixtures of the vein and everything of our, of our uh, resin, I was testing all different things and then found a, a memory improving resin that I mix in there as well. And what I find when I tested them, I literally put like a big, it was like a phone book. It was a, it was a big owner's manual, but like put them on veins. 
and and checked them out and and came in the next day just to see how they how they looked compared to all the other ones. Same arrow, same book, of course, all under it. Put them all out, and I sat them there at my desk and just was sitting there looking at them. And once I looked looked and saw that you know they were all returned ours was still the fastest to return it depends on how extreme it is but in an arrow tube what i find is that most of the time it's not totally smashed obviously when you can you put half one way half the other way but it still can tend to 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 deform them a little bit but all it's going to take is a hair dryer hair dryer or super light heat with a heat gun if you warm these up and literally what I'll do is I'll just smash them this way, smash them that way after it's warm, kind of work them back and forth and warm them up a few times. And after like 10, 15 seconds, they're going to come back exactly the way they were. And the way that uh, I had a plastics expert who sells me the resin, he said, well, the reason that works is because when you make a plastic part and if you make it dead straight, that's the way it wants to be. And if it bends out of shape, all it takes is the right amount of heat to bring it back to its original shape. And so that's where the hair dryer came in. That's a trick I learned years ago with other veins too. And it does work with other veins. Um, but ours, especially if you ever have an issue because they're stiff, if you have them bent up or warped up and it's not coming back, it's either real cold outside or cold where you're at or whatever. And they're not warm enough. Like, so if you get some surface temperature from the sun, it's generally enough to bring them back. So if you're shooting 3D in Georgia and in July, I guarantee you they're going to come back way faster than they will if you're in Ohio in November, you know. And so if you smash them in a bow case, you're going to have to get them warmed up one way or the other. Um, so, but the hair dryer is the easiest trick to bring them back if you're if you don't have access to enough temperature outside or surface temperature from the sun. Very nice. Awesome. Well, um, let's go ahead and dive into some questions from my social media that people might have um, had. So I'm going to have to take this camera for just a moment. And okay. Okay. We have the crappy camera on right now. Perfect. So, first question from Jason Ho Anna. Hopefully, I didn't butcher that name. Any new veins coming to the market soon? We're kind of always working on things. I mean, we try to do our best to stay out ahead. Um, and we definitely will will have some new products potentially in the near future, um, possibly a new color or two. Uh, we got a lot of SKUs right now, and it's already a lot to maintain. But I think there's a pretty good chance that you'll probably see something new within the next year. Okay, guys. The next year. Um, next it question. Admittedly, it could be two, but we're we've got some ideas in the works. Awesome. Okay. His favorite vein to run. Does he run three or four veins? This is from Hunter Burnett. So back to that. I mean, essentially, what you'll find is if you and just to my simplified answer to that is like if you say you got a two inch driver. And if you want to try four fletching that one, if you four fletch a two inch driver, it's going to give you a really similar carrying power to three fletching a two, two, five. So if you jump up in one length size, you can probably get away with three versus four of one size down. If that makes sense. Um, kind of same thing with the matrix, like, and that's apples to apples. So if you do a three fletch, two inch matrix, I'm sorry, three fletch, two inch driver versus a three fletch one seven five matrix it's going to be similar the matrix is shorter and higher so it's going to give you a similar carrying power as the longer or the short yeah longer and lower driver you know same exactly. thing surface two, area yep the two two five driver and a two inch matrix same carrying power very nice so 
what is your favorite vein to run? Um, you know, so for 3D, I shoot the 175 Matrix. And the reason I picked this was several years ago, right before Foley, I got to thinking about it and talking to some of their guys. They're like, man, it's always windy down there, you know? Yeah. And so I'm a, a PS26. I got 150 grains in the front. I shoot 70 pounds, like 29 and a quarter inch draw. And what I, fa- I tested a lot of different veins. This particular arrow on my bow is by far the best large diameter 3D arrow I've ever, of carbon that I've ever gotten to shoot. Where like when I make the shot, it's right behind the pin every time. You know, I've definitely had, you know, more than a few large diameter carbon arrows. But for one reason or another, I just didn't feel like it always hit right behind the pin. But these really do. And so I tested, I actually tested um, this same arrow with a 275 driver, three-fletched, 225 driver, three-fletched, two inch driver, four fletched, two inch matrix, three fletched. And every one of them, I shot at a hundred yards and they all hit a pie plate at a hundred. They're all the same. My goal was to establish, all right, what's my coefficient of drag between these two different ones? How could I possibly measure that? I figured I'd, I'd be seeing like 18, 20 inch difference. No, like when I made a shot, it was inside of a pie plate with all five of those sizes, regardless of the weight. And what it told me is that it's that consistency of spin and things like that. So, so for 3D, I'm shooting this one. That keeps me a little bit more out of the wind because it's such a big diameter arrow. And so for hunting, I hunt with the four-fletch 225 driver. And again, I feel like that carries, you know, 90% of, well, 95% of mechanicals. It'll probably cover 50% of um, you know, normal fixed heads. But if you get into that big traditional style fixed head, I don't really recommend those. I'd go up to the 275. Um, but between my, I have to say I have two favorites, you know, for 3D, I like the 175 matrix for these arrows in a four fletch. And then for hunting, I like the four fletch 225 driver. Um, Levi Morgan's also, he's hunted with those the last two, three years now. And he was a he really liked the two seven five driver ever since they came out. He loved these, and uh, I got him to switch. Well, I mean, we talked about it, of course. And I said, "Hey, just try them and see what they're like." And he's like, "No, they're pounding," you know. So, <clears throat> he, you know, I think that's ultimately my answer to that. <laughs> Very nice. So, um, that also answers Tucker Max Eight's question. If you had to pick one tack vein to use for the rest of your life. What what would you use, and why? So, what would you use? Would it be the two seven five, or would you would you change to the matrix? If I could only if I could only ever shoot one, I'd probably shoot the two seven five driver. Because okay. here's the difference. So when you're talking about a a um, if you go from a two two five driver to a two seven five driver. The only thing that you're gaining is the potential that a 225 might be a little bit better in the wind. Side by side, and again, Nan McCarthy told me, he said, if there was never wind, he said, I would shoot 275s on 23s for 3D. He said, but because we deal with wind, you know, 60% of the time, he said, I stuck with the 225. He said, it's just as accurate, he said, but side by side and no wind whatsoever. He felt like the 275 gave him just a little bit more control. Um, but for that reason, you know, it's one grain difference between a 225 and a 275. So you're not gaining any major advantage there. Um, the only thing that you're essentially doing is you're kind of opening yourself up to a risk that the 225 might not be quite enough. And it's just not worth it. You know, so you might as well have enough because the 275 is not going to just drop off way more. It's not going to have like a parachute effect that the 225 doesn't or anything. So um, to answer that, honestly, I'd say if I could only ever fletch one on everything that I ever shoot, it'd be a 275 driver. Very nice. Next question. Stephen Hudson. What is enough vein what are the drawbacks to too much vein how can you tell um i feel like most of the time you're gonna see too much vein when you go to a floppy vein 
you know, I think that personally is the only time you're really going to see too much with our veins. Like I have, I have a handful of guys that actually shot the three seven fives for 3d. They're like, they're just shooting. Yeah. Jimmy, oh. Jimmy Lutz. I shot them on my 27s at the last tournament last year. Like I just took my indoor arrows and had 150 grain point in them and they shot great. You know what I mean? Like that was, that was my addition there. So like for 26s, I'm running the 275 and a four fletch right now. And they shoot amazing. But yeah, I mean, with wind, you just just don't shoot in the wind, I guess, with 3D. I mean, Foley is probably, probably going to be pretty bad. Um, shoot off like Metropolis, shoot off, and then like uh, Fort Benning. Like if you're going to be in a shoot off, that would be pretty windy too. So, but yeah. Anyway, I mean, any shoot off, honestly, London could be that yeah. way. You know, you're in a you're in a field, but um, as far as drawbacks with too much vein, floppy, you just don't want that that coil, right? Yeah, because essentially you just got that much more vein to start flexing, and the reason why, and and especially that's the other reason why folks were always able to shoot a a floppy vein with a straight just a slight offset because when those veins are all flapping and they're going to flap in different directions, it's not like they're all going to slightly go to the left. If you got them fletched right helical, it's literally, it, and we've seen it in high speed that they're just kind of random, you know? And so when they mm. come out, you know, you have more flexibility and the straight clamp, it's still going to create that drag. Well, what that does is yes, it's going to straighten the knock behind the point. That's ultimately our goal. But, by doing it with drag, my opinion and what I've seen is, again, with the consistency of spin with our veins, and just for instance, all right, we're right, since we're talking about wind, if you go and you shoot and you got a perfect 50-meter mark, are you going to go get that mark when it's real windy? Probably not. So you go and you get your mark, and I've got it. It's perfect. This thing is money, all right? And you get your mark, and you go somewhere else, and it's super windy out. Not only is that mark going to be a little bit, you're going to probably hit low because uh, with a floppy vein, especially like if you got a straight wind, that's coming this way from right to left. I don't know what it looks like on you, but for if yeah. from right to left, you're not just going to hit left with a floppy vein. It's going to hit low as well because you sighted in without that force of wind going by. You know, so it's not just going to hit left, it's going to hit low as well. With our veins, if it hits left at all, it's not going to be low because it's already spinning. So when you create that floppiness and it gets forced into that first little bit of wind, it's basically creating extra drag at that point, which is what makes you hit lower. So with our veins only hitting to the left, you know, that's obviously an advantage. You're closer to your point of impact. It's not low and left. It's just left in that case. And also, I would challenge anybody to say, okay, is it different between a five mile an hour gust and an eight or 10 mile an hour gust? I guarantee you it is, you know? And so, like, that's a big difference is that we're not going to be able to know, you know, oh, exactly how much wind do I have here? You know, you're, you're going to have to try to just be as close as you can, you know, when it's windy. So, um, the reason why a floppy vein like that, I, again, I, I think worked on a straight is just because it already created that little bit of uh, stability to the arrow by creating extra drag. There's never any drag to our veins. So you're not going to see any major parachute effect or anything like that, unless maybe you decide to fletch them on like five or six degree helical and you like crank them because that's how you like them. If you like them that way and they shoot well that way, then by all means have at it. If you're shooting inside a distance that you don't see you know, at 70, 80, 90 yards, well, I can see this thing's tailing off a little bit or something like that. And I mean, there's, there's too many factors, I believe, to really nail that down to exactly what is that? Is that, is that a little bit of wind out there that's not here? Is it actually parachute effect, you know, where the, you know, the point's kind of floating because the, the veins are just a little bit too much, you know, so that's, that's how I would perceive that, that question. Very nice. Okay. Christian Clark. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ask him about the almonds I gave to him that one time. 
I must have been running out of gas. I needed a little something to pick me up, I think. Um, I'm not sure if I remember what that was. I remember we first shot together in London that one year, and uh, he shot awesome. Like he, I think I, I shot an upper 12, and he smoked my arrow and shot a five, and he still won. <laughs> you know? So, oh. yeah. So I didn't mean to keep him out, obviously. It was, but yeah, good kid, like Christian a lot. For sure. We need to get him shooting tac veins. That's right. Yeah, there you go. Um, Dan Gates, with stiff tack veins, when and why a four-fletch for target archers besides clearance? All the time, that's what I would say, but what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, this kind of goes back to um, having four of one size is equal to three of one larger size. You know, if, if you're talking all drivers, four two-inch drivers going to be the same as three two two five drivers. In a matrix, if you do four two-inch matrix, it's going to be the same as three two two five matrix. Um, so what I found is, and, and I, I've been holding this up a couple times, I'll stay out of the way, but like I like that 75105 the flatter four fletch personally. And the reason I like it is, and I started doing that for hunting. This was the old school way to do it when everybody shot them this way because they were shooting a plunger or a burger button and you had to have that clearance in between. So if you wanted to four fletch, you didn't have enough room in between 90 degrees. And so what I found with this is the, the one and only downfall I believe that this has versus 90 degree four fletch is you can't knock tune. You know, you've got four different spots. You can try to see if that particular arrow shoots better with it this way, this way, this way, or this way when they're 90 degrees. With the 75105, which is the flatter four fletch, these two are closer. Um, it gives you more clearance to your launcher. Why not have that? You can leave your rest up longer. The longer it's on your rest, that's technically going to continue to guide your arrow because essentially you're pushing pushing down into your launcher. And so if you get a little more support, that's only going to help. If you want to, and if, if you would decide to try it, you could flip it 180 degrees and see if it flies better there. Um, but what I found for hunting arrows, especially if you're you're shooting out west, you're shooting any long shots, you know, you also get more clearance to your scope this way. You know, you can, you know, essentially don't ever have one straight up like a three fletch would be. Um, a lot of women, obviously, they have a clearance issue with scope when they're trying to dial way down to shoot their longest yardage. You know, if you three fletch, you got one sticking straight up where the 75 105 gives you a little more clearance. Very nice. So at the end of the day, why would you pick a four fletch? Um, if you fletch them 90 degrees, it gives you that option to, to knock tune. You can essentially still do that with three. Um, I've heard, you know, you get mixed reviews from, from pros and not from the same. It's not like the same one says, well, this worked this day and this worked this day and whatever. But like certain guys find, like I, I just had a, a Garrett Ayersman was just telling me, he said, man, I shot four 225 drivers and I shot three 275 drivers. And just out of my setup that time, he said, I felt like the three 275 shot better for me. So that's what I went with. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not saying this is him, but like for most of like common archers like myself, um, I don't know that I'll be able to tell, but I can tell one thing when I'm knocking it on, I know which one I'm shooting. So I may not make the exact same shot. Not that you're going to try it or anything, but like the uh, same thing with the broadhead, man, if I could just shoot and not like close my eyes and just stick it on there and just make the shot and not know I'm shooting a broadhead and putting extra pressure on myself to aim better, to really make a good shot and see if my broadhead's tuned. That's not the same mm -hmm. shot field point, you know? So a little bit of my theory on that, you know, um, but I don't think there's any major advantage to one over the other, particularly I've not, not really heard one. The only thing that I've ever heard um, was essentially when you have four, you just got more different areas of surface area that are able to grab that clean air and, and start the spin. But I think that's kind of minute. Very nice. Um, okay. Matthew Burns. 
would they consider expanding into making other products, bars, arrows, etc.? Mm, I'm not sure. I mean, it, I, I don't really see that, but I mean, I can't put anything off the table. Uh, I'll be honest. I mean, we're, we're pushed to try to be innovative. We we're pushed to like continue to be trying new things and doing different things. Um, we've got, we've got a lot going on to be honest with Swacker. Um, not, it's not an excuse, but you know, we brought all of our production to the U S. And so when we did that, that ties up a lot of my time. We got a lot of SKUs there and it's a little bigger nut than TAC is. And so I've got to dedicate time there. Tax doing well as it is. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've got a lot to manage in it, you know, because of all the SKUs, but yeah, I, I stabilizers. I'm not so sure we'd ever get into that. You know, like there's a lot of stabilizers out there and there's a lot of stabilizer companies, you know, personally i'm friends with like several different companies and you know that that would deter me a little bit you know but like i don't really see that we would do that particularly gotcha okay um archery smk is there any way to get tack veins to stick better uh reverse because we talked about all that yeah i would say a yep. uh, hundred you know 90 well 95 percent of it is set in the jig and follow the instructions i mean there's not much more but one of the things that i did uh you know think about when we were sent and i said hey look guys you know to our marketing department i said i want to offer an adhesion guarantee and what that essentially has turned into is most of the time they're like, what's up with this adhesion guarantee? These didn't stick at all. You know, what's the problem? It gives me an opportunity to speak to the person, explain some of the process to them. And we literally go way above and beyond um, in, you know, especially in our emails. Like if you email into our website, info at tacveins.com, which you just go to the contact us page and you email a, a form in there, Give us some specifics and ask your question. I, I personally answer all the technical ones as of right now. I'm training someone else who will take that over, but that's a part that's near and dear to me that I want people to get the, the correct information and I want them to have consistent information. And so um, I will personally be the one to answer all of those. So, you know, send them in, you know, I've got a, I honestly have a pretty canned response for most of them where I can just hit you know, there, and I modify it slightly to, to fit what you sent me. Um, but I'll give you all the instructions, send you the links, but you know, that guy right there is probably going to tell you as much as, as, as you need. But after that, after that and adjust the jig until it sticks, there's not much else, but I'm more than happy to, to troubleshoot with folks and see if there's anything we can establish. Um, you know, so, something that, that does happen pretty often is I think glue control is a really big part of, of people getting them to stick. I've had more than a few like really reputable shooters that are like, you know what I figured out and, and I've been working with them back and forth is they're like, all I started doing was applying a little more glue and stuck it on there. I still didn't have a ton squeezing out, but essentially what they're saying is what I was using in the past as a nice thin bead just wasn't quite enough. You know, it wasn't filling out that entire base. You know, if you, if you have nothing squishing out both sides or at least one side, it depends on where it's set. Most of the time it'll come out mostly on one side for me, you know, like where my left side of most of my veins, almost always I wipe a good bit off. There might be a little bit on the other side to wipe off. Um, but I think that also helps because like the, the radiuses, you know, on the very edge of our vein, when you, when you wipe some glue right along there, it creates an, a weld the entire length of the vein on each side. So why not have an additional insurance that, you know, got a little extra glue there and, um, you know, same thing with the starting and stopping a quarter inch from each end of the vein with your bead when it comes out. Most of the time, if I, if I control it well enough, I can see it really well in the light and you may not be able to see it, but I see it. each one of these veins has a little bit of glue right at the very end. And I don't wipe that off. I leave it there. Most people tip and tail their veins with a little bead of glue and that's fine. But this essentially does it on its own and I don't have to wipe it. I only wipe 
the, the, the sides and I leave that little bit on the ends, then I think that makes a really big difference as well. Cause essentially if you hit into a target, you know, if it starts to lift, it might all come off, but that will create a bit of a ramp so that it, so that it goes up the vein instead of underneath it. Very nice. So one thing I've learned from you as well is, um, when you're using a Bissenberger, you just push the vein base parallel with the shaft straight down. You don't like put the butt of the vein on and then work it up. Is that right? There's I that ultimately comes down to exactly where the jig had to be set to get the seal that you need. There I have I have guys that you know love our veins that have no problem fletching them and they roll it on. And I think it's just going to be the minute differences and exactly where you have it set on whether or not that works. Um, like if I do that most of the time, I think with m- the way I set mine and everything, which again, that operating window is small, but most of the time where I find I have mine set, it doesn't work to roll. Like I'll sometimes have the leading edge of the vein will like curl under or right. do something different. So you can definitely try either. Neither one of them is wrong. Um, but you know, either one's good. It's, I think the key is getting good, consistent pressure, the whole length of the vein, squeezing that for five seconds and before you pull the clamp. Gotcha. So next question, Adam Wagner. First of all, he's a great guy to shoot with. My question would be with all the changes in vein technology that we've seen over the past few years to include changes in length, size, shape, material what does he think the next big thing could be well admittedly uh one thing i've just seen is that you know i feel like we're we're being complimented by you know other vein companies by making a vein that looks a lot like ours i'll take that you know but um ultimately it's like I mean, we definitely can can change shapes. We can definitely change sizes. Um, shapes do make a pretty big difference. Uh, the length to height ratio is probably one of the biggest parts of it um, that I'm finding. But there are different things that can, again, change your center of pressure slightly. Um, they can change noise slightly. They change the amount of sp- the spin rate, the drag. So there's definitely a lot of things that you can do. We've done a lot of testing. Uh, if you haven't checked out our LRP video on YouTube, like it, we go into pretty big detail into like we shoot them through a whisker biscuit just to show what they do. Essentially, if you get vein contact, you know, it shows how fast they recover after that. Um, it shows the, the amount of drag and drop, you know, veins have, you know, one to the other, um, you know, and things like that. And so ultimately it's like with, because our veins essentially uh, where I was saying earlier, where I did those like five different vein configurations on the same arrow. And even though the total weight was different, they still grouped at a hundred yards together. I'm like, I don't know that I can do a lot with our vein because we we actually run the same material and cut every one of our vein models out of the same material because there's no need to to change it. Like you don't have to make our our three seven fives don't have to be thicker or wider or anything like that. It's the same material. We just cut it out the different shape out of it, you know. So I think that's a that's definitely a difference um, in that regard. But um, if anything, you know, it may be playing with different shapes, maybe slightly different height to length ratios and things like that. But I would say that's probably going to be as, as far as I, as far as I can foresee as of right now without, you know, giving away all the secrets. <laughs> there you go. So next question. Let's see if we have any more. I will take this time to congratulate you again on on uh, on your finish last week. That was incredible. Super glad to see you do it. You know, so I'm yeah, happy. Um, I got very lucky, I think, at the end of the day. But um, yeah, I appreciate it, man. It was it was incredible. The best shooting I've probably ever done. And um, yeah, I just I have a setup that's really easy to shoot. Doesn't require a lot of maintenance. And yeah. It's been, it's been very good. So. Good. Well, people don't luck into the shoot off, so you can, you can take that for what it's worth. <laughs> That's hilarious. And it's true. But, um, 
Louis Holmes the third. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Who does he stay with at events and what do they do? Oh, well, Louie, he's got his own archery shop now, and he, I know he's doing that full-time. Um, had, had a good time always staying with him. Zach Plonsky, um, awesome, awesome shooter, um, you know, generally stay with him. Uh, Riley Sobel, I've been staying with him. Um, he shooting, shoots in the open pro class as well, shoots really well. Um, so that's mostly what I'm trying to bump elbows with guys that shoot a lot better than me and see if they can't, you know, rub off a little bit, you know, but – I go back and I reflect on my round and, and, you know, I'm not going to lie. I don't put an ounce of time into it that I should. Um, I feel like I know how to do it, but I can't always do it because I just don't, didn't have any time behind the string. It's not an excuse. It's just me being transparent. Um, but yeah, so that's how I'd answer that. Jake Marlowe, oftentimes he stays with us and I know Jake just started his own shop too. So, uh, definitely look at those guys anywhere in their area you know look them up we're going to be make sure they get set up with tack veins and swacker broadheads and everything so there's a lot of potential there for sure um i believe that is all of our questions going to go back through here one more time okay Perfect. Where can people find you on social media? Uh, just my name or uh, Tack Veins, obviously. For me personally, uh, which I'm not you're probably not looking for me, but uh, Tack Veins. We have an Instagram, we have a Facebook, and uh, you know, readily available. And uh, so, any kind of announcements, uh, field staff, things like that. So, like for uh, um, Tack Veins, we just chose our our team this year, and November December is generally when we put out applications, allow people to apply. Um, so definitely keep an up on our social media pages. We do have a YouTube channel as well. Um, so if you follow up with all those things, we'll always post out a link saying, "Hey, you know, if you want to get on, join the team, jump on the field staff team, and and reach out." Um, if you're on the, in a pro class, then by all means, reach out to me and I'll do whatever I can, you know, talk to you about it. It's not going to be anything personal. It's mostly budget related. Um, but I, I, I want to build our team and I want to have the best people that we can get. And I, I'm not going to pressure people, you know, like I understand if, if a better opportunity comes down the road for somebody, I would never want to hold anybody back, you know? So by all means, we want people, uh, we want to, we want to keep the best that we can and, uh, yeah, you know, so that's what I would say. Very nice. Okay. It's been an excellent podcast, Randy. And we will also have a discount code for people that want to order directly from tacveins.com. Um, I don't know exactly what that code is, but it will be in the description of this podcast or this YouTube video. So, but anyway, guys, um, that's it for this one.